Welcome to Bible 180 Ezra. After Persia supplants Babylon as the new reigning superpower of the ancient Near East, some Jews received permission from King Cyrus to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Cyrus even sends back some of the original gold and artifacts from the temple. Large empires regularly transplanted newly subjugated peoples to force refugees to adopt a new culture, religion, and national identity. The genealogies, tribal affiliations, and silverware lists in Ezra emphasize the Jews' identity as God's people, even though they are in exile. Zerubbabel is the leader of the first returning group. They restore the altar to make offerings in accordance with the Torah. As they lay the foundations for the temple, some Jews rejoice. However, some of the older Jews who had seen Solomon's original temple cry out in sorrow. The noise they make can be heard for miles, but those who hear it can't tell whether it's a happy or sad noise. Some inhabitants who had been living in the region approached Zerubbabel and offered to help rebuild the temple, which is kind of like offering to become the same people. Zerubbabel refuses. These rejects respond by writing a slanderous letter to the new king, Xerxes, who stops the temple project. Then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah show up and a letter is sent to the new king, Darius. The temple work restarts. However, when the temple is completed, it's clearly not as good as Solomon's temple. There's no holy smokes or affirmation from Yahweh as there had been when the tabernacle and the temple were dedicated. Then Ezra arrives, leading another group of exiles with more financial support sent by yet another king, Artaxerxes. When Ezra finds out that many of the people have married Gentiles, he tears his tunic, pulls out his hair, and a lengthy and heartfelt prayer of repentance is recorded. His solution is to have the men divorce these women and send them away. It's hard to draw any straightforward lessons from Ezra. Should Zerubbabel have refused help? The Torah and its procedure certainly shouldn't have been ignored, yet Israel is supposed to be interceding for the nations and teaching others to honor Yahweh. The Jews in Jerusalem should have put their faith first and married faithful women, but was Ezra's decreed divorce really a God-pleasing answer? Malachi, a contemporary, seems to condemn this solution. It's good the exiles had returned, but there's a real sense of incompleteness. Is this temple really approved by Yahweh? How should Israel be interacting with the Gentiles? Were God's leaders handling things correctly? These questions are left unanswered. And that tension is there by God's design. There must be a better way of being God's people, a better leader, a better temple, a better way of interacting with non-Jews must be out there. The questions in this book are God's people will continue to struggle with and often miss the mark on until Jesus arrives. A new and eternal solution to these quandaries will be proposed by a prophet from Nazareth. The fulfillment of God's plan of salvation is a new covenant in Christ.